I'm going to talk about two related things. The first will be uh, some recent studies of uh, the genetics of cancer uh, and what uh, has been learned. Uh, and then I'll break for uh, questions. And then the second part will be focused on how we might use this information to help patients with cancer in a very specific way uh, that involves microbiology. So let's see. So as you all know, cancer is in essence a genetic disease that has been proved beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, and it's now possible for the first time within the last few years um, to sequence every gene, every one of the 20,000 or so genes in any cell, including a human cancer cell. Um, and that, that has led to some new insights about what the nature of cancer is. And the most important lesson from these sequencing studies um, is it allows us to at least tentatively answer some questions about the basic nature of cancer. So an exome is um, the collection of all exons that represent the 20,000 or so genes in the human genome. And the exomes, uh, in general, have been sequenced in these genome-wide studies because they represent only about 1.5% of the total genome. So it's considerably easier to sequence them. And they, of course, contain, contain all the coding genes, uh, which presumably are the most uh, important. Um, for cancer as well as other diseases. And this list uh, shows the cancers that so far uh, have been sequenced. Um, it's been a worldwide effort, um, both the United States, Canada, and, United, uh, and um, Britain uh, have led the way. Um, the tumors in red uh, are those from our lab. Um, and the people in our lab uh, who have done this work are shown here. There are four very talented graduate students and four um, postdoctoral fellows. And of course, it takes a village to do this kind uh, of study. Uh, lots of others, oncologists, surgeons, bioinformaticians, statisticians, uh, a lot of people have lent their expertise. Uh, and I will be speaking for all of them. But, the, but perhaps the most simple question to ask about these data is simply, how many genes are altered in a typical solid tumor? Because you can sequence all of them, you can now answer that question precisely. And this slide shows the data on pancreatic cancers, 24 pancreatic cancers. Um, the x-axis shows the number of each of those 24 cancers. The y-axis shows the mutations per tumor. And on average, there are about 46 non-silent point mutations or small insertions or deletions in these tumors. Um, we're only talking about those which change the amino acid, so they're non-silent. And there are a couple of, uh, of things that are of interest here. First, the variation from tumor to tumor doesn't vary that much. Um, mo in most of these 24 cases, there are 30 to 70 mutations um, per cancer. There are a couple outliers, but it's pretty consistent from tumor to tumor, more so than what one might have expected um, ab initio. And the reason for that consistency is really that these mutations are simply a clock. Every time a cancer cell or a normal cell divides, it accumulates uh, a small number of mutations. And the reason that these cancers have roughly the same number of mutations is because they have divided roughly the same number of times. Now, as we'll see in a few minutes, some of these mutations are causally involved in growth. Most are not. Point mutations, small insertions or deletions of a few base pairs, of course, not the only 
uh, alteration in tumors in addition to point mutations indicated in blue. There are amplifications. Amplifications um, in this slide represent those in which there are now 10 copies of a gene per cell instead of the normal two copies. And amplifications generally indicate that there's an oncogene involved, something that the cancer wants more copies of, whereas deletions, and in this case I mean homozygous deletions, so both copies, both the maternal and paternal copies of the gene, are gone from the cell. There are a few of them in most cancers, and they indicate the underlying presence of a tumor suppressor gene, a break which the cancer wants to get rid of. And if you add all of them up, you get about 50 alterations per tumor. Now, for my uh, students, I try to give them some context to think about these numbers. And the one I use, uh, I'll show you here, uh, I try to think about the human genome as an encyclopedia of sorts. And in this encyclopedia, each gene is represented by a page which contains 1,500 characters, 1,500 bases, obviously A, C, G's, and T's rather than the alphabet. The genes themselves are organized into books representing a chromosome. Each book or each chromosome contains about 1,000 genes, 1,000 pages. And then the genome is, of course, simply an encyclopedia of the 46 books, 23 inherited from each parent. And if you look at the cancer genome as an encyclopedia, then you find that compared to the encyclopedia of normal cells from the same patient, because here I'm talking about just somatic mutations, mutations that are present in the cancer but not present in the normal cells of these patients, then there are 46 pages with typographical errors, two missing pages, um, those represent the homozygous deletions, and two duplicated pages, which represent the amplifications. For a total of 50 typographical errors, indicated here by these blue, green, and red dots. Now, if you are a publisher, and you published an encyclopedia, which had only 50 typographical errors, you would be doing a remarkably good job. Um, and this analogy is reasonable in the sense that you can see, and the students can see, how little different the cancer genome is from the normal genome. It's almost the same. It's remarkably different disease, say, from but those associated with bacterial infections, where all the thousand genes of a bacteria are quite different um, in every base compared to the genes uh, of a human. And these few differences are the reason why cancers are so difficult to treat. But it's even more difficult than that because there are some complications even to this relatively simple picture I've presented. The first is heterogeneity. So this is the pancreatic cancer genome of one patient called PA34C. Now look at a second pancreatic cancer from a different patient. Here I've put black circles around the genes that are mutated in both of these tumors. And there are only four. In these, in these two cases, but you could compare any two pancreatic cancers or any two colon cancers or any two breast cancers, and you find exactly the same thing. Of the 50 or so mutations in each of them, there are only a few that are the same in both tumors, even though they look identical under the microscope. This heterogeneity obviously can and probably does underlie much of the biologic heterogeneity and the properties of the tumor cells, as well as the variations in response uh, to the treatments that we try to give patients. And of course, these aren't the only genetic alterations. 
um, in tumors. Uh, in addition to these, there are translocations. Each tumor has one or two of them. And there are epigenetic changes, changes in expression driven by methylation of chromin and proteins in DNA. I don't like complications. <laughs> so let me give you a couple of simplifications, which I think can put this in perspective. The first, as I mentioned before, most of the mutations that we see are really not drivers. How do you define a driver? A driver gene or a driver mutation is one that increases the ratio of cell birth to cell death. In all of our normal cells in adults, there is a precise ratio between cell birth and cell death. And that ratio is, of course, 1.000000, as many zeros as you like. If the ratio is off, if it's less than one, and there's more cell death than cell birth, then the tissue will atrophy. If the ratio is greater than one, if there's more cell birth than cell death, that, in essence, is neoplasia. And a driver simply changes that um, ratio f to be greater than one. A passenger has no effect on that ratio. And if we go back to our encyclopedia and subtract out all of the passengers, which is any gene whose mutation does not confer an increased selective growth advantage, and the picture is much simpler. You see somewhere between 5 and 15 drivers. That precise number is difficult to get because it's actually difficult to determine which genes are drivers and which genes are passengers in many cases. But it definitely simplifies the picture. And the second simplification, which is also very real, is that there are about 200 cancer genes, either oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, which have been um, discovered so far. There are many more thousands which have been discovered and postulated to be cancer genes. Most of them, I believe, are not really cancer genes. But these 200 bona fide ones are, and they can be organized into 12 core pathways. Now, you all know what a pathway means. Uh, here's one of my favorites, the PIK3CA pathway. Um, it starts with a, with a receptor on the cell surface, on the membrane. The signal received from that receptor, say a growth-related uh, growth hormone, is conveyed to an intermediary messenger, to other enzymes, and then finally to the nucleus where generally it changes the transcription patterns and gene regulation within the cell. And the red and um, blue circles in this diagram show various genes which can be mutated in, in this case, either breast or colon cancers. But in pancreatic cancers, um, we can list 12 pathways which all of the genes that have been identified to be mutant fit. And these are well-known pathways involved in growth control. For example, TGF-beta, SMAD, is one such pathway. Um, the ligand or the signaling molecule in this case, case is TGF-beta or a member of the TGF-beta family. It interacts with receptors for that ligand, the TGF-beta receptor type 2, and members of its family. And the intermediaries in this pathway are SMAD4 and others. And each of the um, clock-like blue ovals in this diagram represent one of the 12 core pathways which these genes can be organized into. If you look at two pancreatic cancers and draw the same pathways, one of them is called PA10 and the other one something else. I can't see it. But the important point is that in the first cancer, it has a mutation in one of the genes in this pathway. 
And I think, what is that, SMAD4, receptor 2, something like that. One of the genes. And the other cancer has a mutation in another gene in the same pathway. So even though these two cancers are heterogeneous, this reflects back to the heterogeneity slide I showed you before, the pathways through which these mutated genes uh, act converge. And the mutated genes in these two cases do the same thing. They basically interfere with the proper function of that TGF-beta pathway. And the same is true for all 12 pathways. The second part of my talk will be devoted to understanding how we can use this information to reduce cancer deaths. But before I get to that, let me pause and ask you if you have any questions about the genetic basis of human cancer or uh, the recent information about sequencing genes. Feel free to raise your hand. Yes. Yes, that's a good question. So, <laughs> and also a difficult one to answer. <laughs> Um, but I'll give you the real answer, and you can decide how to answer a student that might ask it. Right. Uh, each of the cells in our body has mutations, and the number of mutations simply depends on how many divisions that cell has undergone. So if you look at a skin cell, for example, that will have many more mutations than if you look at a brain cell, or a liver cell, or a muscle cell, because they, they have replicated uh, relatively few times compared to skin cells, or intestinal epithelial cells, or blood cells, which turn over every few days. Now, if you look at a whole population of cells, each of which contains a very small number of mutations, you don't see any of them. Right, because each cell has its own distinct pattern of mutations. Um, and if you look at, say, five micrograms of DNA, which would be five million cells, when you look at it in aggregate with the sequencing techniques we use, all we see is the initial germline DNA sequence. We can't see one in a million mutations. So the answer is, um, all of our cells have the same DNA except for cancer cells, but that's, as you can see, not really true. Each of our cells has a slightly different genetic constitution. But when, when we say a somatic mutation in the cancer, we mean that every cell within that cancer has the same mutation. It's a so-called clonal change. And the reason it's clonal is because it's a driver. So a cell acquired that mutation, that cell underwent a select or achieved a selective growth advantage because of that driver gene mutation and then overgrew all the other sister cells in the population. The same is true of the passengers. The initial cell, for example, that got the first driver gene mutation, sometimes we call that a gatekeeper, all of the mutations that have occurred since, since conception in that cell, in that, say, if we're talking about a pancreatic epithelial cell, every mutation that occurred from conception until that first driver mutation is fixed in that cell, right? All of them are passengers because they haven't done anything until that cell acquired a driver gene mutation. And then that cell will proliferate and will become, a, will become the tumor, but it's carried al along all those passengers. And we can actually tell how many times a cell has divided by simply looking at the passenger mutations. And doing that, we can tell, for example, that a colon epithelial cell, a normal colon epithelial cell, has divided many more times than a pancreatic duct epithelial cell or than a, a brain tumor cell. So does that answer the question? Okay. Yes. 
Yes, so her, her question uh, is, are we seeing uh, mutations that involve the immune system? Because um, the idea that there's a defect in immunity uh, has long uh, been invoked as one of the um, predisposing factors for cancer development. Um, and the answer to that question is no. We don't see any uh, genetic alterations that are related to the immune system. However, that doesn't mean that we can't use those alterations for immunotherapy. And one of the ways to exploit this information, I, I won't talk about it um, today because it's a bit off topic, but is related to your question. There are, say, 50 alterations in a pancreatic cancer which are not found in any normal cell or in any population of normal cells. That means there are 50 different new antigens because each of these mutations encodes a slightly different protein that the body has never seen. They're neoantigens. They're almost like a bacterial infection um, in the sense uh, of being infected with a new bacteria or virus. So one idea is um, to use a kind of personalized vaccine. We sequence a, t uh, a person's cancer, which we can now do quite easily. When we started these studies, it cost us about $100,000 a patient. That was only in 2006. That was the first time a cancer uh, genome had been sequenced. It now cost us $800. Um, so, and it, in a decade, it will cost $80. All right, so this is not going to be expensive or impossible to do. Um, it's also not going to, well, I'll get to that in a while. But so you could sequence a patient's tumor, could sequence their normal cells, and you could find the 50 epitopes, um, the mutations that change the coding region, and you could predict in silico using bioinformatics, which one of those epitopes should bind to the patient's histocompatibility loci and are likely to be good antigens in that particular patient. And we've done that in silico again, and we find that about 10 of the 50 are reasonable antigens. Then you could make those antigens, in theory, peptides and give them with a, an appropriate adjuvant as a vaccine to a cancer patient and hopefully elicit antibodies to the patient's tumor in a very specific way. So to date, there have been a lot of attempts to use the patient's immune system um, against his or her tumor. They have generally failed, but they have always been relatively nonspecific. Here, for the first time, we have the capacity to make very specific vaccines. Now, whether that will work, I don't know, but it, it's one of the possibilities uh, raised by these, these kinds of data. Yes, um, did everyone hear his question? Okay. Um, these are great questions. How do I get my students to ask questions like these? <laughs> All right, so, yes, the question is, we do miss mutations that are present in the normal cells when we do this, um, and the re if we don't look at the normal, uh, at the mutations or variations, I shouldn't call them mutations, in the normal cells, because every time we do this, we look not only at the tumor, but, of, uh, but at the normal cells to tell which ones are somatic. Now, uh, only about 5% of patients inherit a mutation that predisposes them to cancer. But we, just like you, realize this potential um, about four years ago. And one of the pancreatic cancer patients we sequenced um, 
we noticed had a sister who had developed pancreatic cancer in her 50s in addition to the index patient who developed pancreatic cancer in his 60s. And pancreatic cancers are uncommon enough that we thought this may indicate a hereditary predisposition. So we looked back at all of the normal variations. Now, if you look at any two individuals, these two, for example, um, you find in their coding regions alone about 20,000 differences. 20,000 differences between this gentleman's normal cell genome and the reference genome, right? So it's a problem. There are all these variations. How do you figure out which one of those 20,000 variations might have predisposed the patient to a cancer? That's the difficult part. In that one case, um, which was a prototypical case, we were able to do that. And the way we were able to do it is first, we excluded all of the variations that were known to occur in normal individuals. There are various databases which list polymorphisms, et cetera. And there will be more and more. There's the Thousand Genomes Project, which I'm sure many of you have heard about in which a thousand different normal people from various backgrounds will be completely sequenced. So we could eliminate about, if we did it today, we could eliminate about 90% of the, of the variations that way, and we're left with 2,000 uh, variations. 2,000 is still a lot. We can't individually functionally test 2,000 variations, but we can use uh, I guess, are smart to say, well, what kind of gene and what kind of mutation might be responsible? Uh, and we can narrow that down from 2,000 in that particular case down to only three changes. And one of those three turned out to be real. It was an activating mutation in a gene wh um, which was known to bind to another uh, whose protein that was encoded was known to bind to another protein which was a cancer predisposition gene. In this case, the gene was called PALB2, and its protein bound to BRCA2, okay, which is a known breast cancer susceptibility gene, not pancreatic cancer, but you can follow the reasoning. And then we found that same alteration in other hereditary pancreatic cancer patients. So you can do that, and that's the wave of the future. The interesting question is whether you want to do this to everybody at birth, right, before they get cancer, or before they get heart disease, or before you figure out whether they should be athletes or, or uh, scientists, or, right? And that's a much more complex question, um, which I'm sure we all could spend days debating right now. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's it, that except for families which have clear predispositions to disease, any such whole genome evaluation of normal individuals is premature and is likely to do more harm than good. But that may change uh, with, with further studies. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. She, um, she has noticed we're only sequencing the exomes. Again, that's only one and a half percent. Um, we could sequence the whole genome now. Uh, it, now that it's getting cheaper, you could do that. It only costs about $4,000 now to sequence the whole genome. $800 roughly to sequence the whole exome. That's, that's real cost. Not, you know, that's not including labor and all the other stuff. Um, but the reason we did not do that before and still do not do it um, is twofold. The first reason, if we look at known cancer genes, um, say in families predisposed to colorectal cancer. So we know what genes predispose patients to colorectal cancer. And let's say we take 100 families or patients with hereditary colorectal cancer and just sequence their exons. then. Uh, we discover about 90% of the mutations. So that means there are about 10% of mutations which are presumably in promoter regions or other regulatory uh, non-coding exons. So we're missing 
Um, that's one reason we didn't do it. Um, it. It's a lot of extra work and analysis to get 10%. The second reason is it's difficult enough to distinguish passengers from drivers when you have a mutation that changes um, one codon to another. So, so it makes a, a very distinctive change, functional change, in the encoded product. If you have a change in the promoter region, 10 kb upstream of the gene or in the middle of an intron, it's basically impossible with today's tools to know whether that's a passenger or a driver. So we, we don't even have the capacity to interpret those uh, even if we did look for them. So that's another reason we don't do it. Any other? Yes. Yes, that's another good question. Um, subclones within tumors. Um, tumors proceed through waves of clonal evolution. So when we look at a tumor in this way, what we're actually looking at in evolutionary, tumor evolutionary terms, we, a we actually work quite closely with, with a guy named Martin Nowak, who's the head of evolutionary dynamics at Harvard, who studies evolution uh, of organisms, basically. And the equations he and, and his colleagues in the field have developed, you, you can actually apply exactly to tumor evolution. You don't have to change the equations one bit. You just have, uh, have to change some of the uh, assumptions about frequencies, et cetera. So when we're looking for um, mutations here, what we're actually looking for is the, or at is the genetic constitution of the cell that acquired the last driver gene mutation and then proliferated to form the tumor mass now composed of billions of daughter cells. Each of those billions of daughter cells had the compendium of genetic alterations in that founder cell. Okay, if, if it requires five driver mutations, then the cell that got that last driver gene mutation is the founder cell, and that accumulated to literally billions of daughter cells. Each of those billions of daughter cells has its own compendium of additional mutations, which we don't see when we sequence. And that is one of the problems with therapy of solid tumors, because even uh, with a good drug, um, there are lots of cells which have mutations um, which haven't yet provided a selective growth advantage, perhaps, but could do so under selective conditions which you have instituted by trying to get rid of the cancer with a drug. And that is, in essence, what causes drug resistance. So that heterogeneity, you can call it subclones if you want, um, which would be accurate, is one of the primary reasons for, for drug failure. MicroRNAs are taken into consideration in, in all of ours and others' new sequence, uh, new sequencing uh, initiatives. We've looked at all the microRNAs. No one has ever found a microRNA to be altered in cancers. That doesn't mean that they don't play a role in cancers, but they appear not to play a primary role. Um, they, they could certainly be deregulated by, by other means, but, but they're not mutated. Uh, okay, my clock has stopped. Does that mean I still have 50 minutes left? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let me go on, then we come back to the end, uh, at the end, for more questions. So, this is the real question. This is why all this work is done, of course. And everybody's favorite strategy for curing cancer right now is to target the mutations. Drugs uh, that specifically inhibit the action of a mutated oncogene, cancer gene, but I really do mean oncogene as you'll see in a few moments. So Gleevec is a prototype. Gleevec is used to treat chronic myelogenous leukemia and a couple of other uh, tumors. Uh, 
The idea, idea there is that Gleevec uh, is an ATP mimic, structural mimic. Uh, it binds to the pocket in which ATP normally binds and inhibits ATP binding. Um, the target here is the BCR ABL tyrosine kinase, which phosphorylates substrates. We still don't know what substrates it actually phosphorylates, but that doesn't matter. Whatever it phosphorylates is inhibited by Gleevec um, when it binds in that same pocket. And this is the poster child for targeted chemotherapy. It was uh, first uh, shown to be effective, and it's extremely effective in chronic myelogenous leukemia, um, uh, I guess about eight years ago now. And this raised everyone's hopes that similar drugs could be used to target more common cancers, particularly um, solid tumors uh, such as colon, lung, pancreas, breast, prostate, et cetera, which accounts for 90 percent of the cancer deaths in this country. Um, what became clear was that single targeted agents, uh, and there have been several do dozen tested, often have a good effect, but they induce remissions that last for weeks or months, maximum of a year. They don't result in long-term remissions. They don't result in cures when used alone for the reason that somebody mentioned. Uh, at least that's one of the reasons. There's a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of possibilities for developing resistance. So um, the future of this particular form of therapy is thought to lie in combinations. Um, and it's actually quite similar uh, to what happened with HIV. Initially, HIV therapies, um, single drugs, uh, certainly exerted a substantial and important effect, but we never really got long-term remissions, perhaps even cures, with any HIV therapies until the era of heart, which we, in which um, many drugs are combined. And the, the idea is the same here. Um, now, is this therapy or this combination feasible in cancer? Unfortunately, there are some difficulties with it. This gets back to oncogenes versus tumor suppressor genes. Remember, if you will, that oncogenes are activated by mutations. They become constitutively active, active all the time. They're like what I tell my students is they're the accelerators of a cell. And if you have uh, an oncogene mutation, it's like having accelerators stuck to the floor. You can still stop the tumor, though, because you have tumor suppressor genes. These are the breaks. And it's only when a couple accelerators are stuck to the floor and when all the breaks are inactivated, made dysfunctional, that the car, the cell, spins out of control. Um, and, and that's a reasonable analogy for what happens with cancer. Um, the problem is, if you look at the mutations that are actually present in common tumors, and here I've listed all of the new genes that weren't suspected to be drivers until this uh, error of whole genome analysis, almost all of them are tumor suppressor genes, not oncogenes. And the only oncogenes are listed on this slide, and they are only uh, uh, only operative in a small number of relatively uncommon tumor types. That is, most of the genes altered in cancer are, uh, cancers are tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes cannot be directly targeted by drugs. What every drug does is it inhibits the function of an enzyme or it inhibits the binding of uh, its target protein to some other protein or ligand. Drugs inhibit things. They don't create things. You can't create activity when there's none to begin with. Many tumor suppressor genes are completely gone from the cell. They're homozygously deleted. They're absent. No drug can bring that gene back, can reactivate something that's not there. And Unfortunately, most of the genetic alterations in cancers in the, in the common solid tumors are tumor suppressor gene mutations, not oncogene mutations. And if you look at individual tumors, most solid tumors, say a pancreatic cancer in patient A, have 
either a zero or one oncogene mutation. And that's true across the board. Um, most cancers have zero or one. Occasionally you'll find a cancer that has two, but mostly zero or one. That makes this idea of combining targeted therapies against mutated oncogenes unlikely to be practicable. Now, that's bad news, but it's not hopeless. And the reason it's not hopeless is because you don't necessarily have to target the mutated gene product itself. You can also think about targeting the pathways. Um, because the suppressor genes act through the same pathways as the oncogenes. It's not as specific a treatment as inhibiting the mutated oncogenes product, protein product directly, but it's still reasonably specific, and that's what most of the pharmaceutical companies are now working on. Different strategy, rather than targeting uh, a specific gene, try to target, say, the end stage of the pathway and capture um, tumors that have mutated genes anywhere in that pathway, whether they're oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And another, I guess, hopeful thing about that strategy is that there are only 12 pathways, and many of them are targetable. Um, but there's one pathway that underlies at least 10 of the 12 I've indicated on this slide and that's angiogenesis, the development of blood vessels. All of these tumors, as they grow, need to get nutrients in order to continue to grow. And many of these pathways, in fact, stimulate new vessels, angiogenesis, as part of their function. You have to get more oxygen, you have to get more nutrients. If you're more than 100 microns away from a capillary, a cell can't grow, even a cancer cell. So angiogenesis is one uh, potential pathway, or I should say grand pathway target. And there are, uh, is one approved drug that inhibits angiogenesis, uh, which is called Avastin. Many of you have heard of that. It, um, uh, it, it inhibits the binding of VEGF, the uh, vascular endothelial cell growth factor, to its receptor. It, it works okay. Um, it doesn't work as well as we'd like. But the concept is sound. What hasn't been as much appreciated um, as the fact that cells, that tumor cells need new vessels, is that in vivo, the tumor cells often outgrow their vascular components. So if you look at a typical solid tumor, you see that it has an oxic perimeter, that is well oxygenated perimeter, but a large part of the inside mass is hypoxic, and the core is often completely devoid of oxygen. It's anoxic. Um, and this is true of at least 75 percent of solid tumor masses, whether they be pancreatic cancers, colon cancers, breast cancers, etc. And this suggests another strategy, actually a very old one. Um, the first uh, I guess embodiment of this uh, strategy is a study by Parker that was over 60 years ago. Um, and uh, Parker and uh, his colleagues r realized that these anoxic or hypoxic regions of tumors were unique in the body. There is no other part of the body that should be uh, hypoxic. And, um, per, and they used an anaerobic bacterium to try to target these regions, hoping that the bacteria would grow within those regions, those hypoxic or anoxic regions, and kill the tumor. And they had some reasonable 
uh, initial success, but then it stopped. There were problems with toxicity, et cetera. But we liked this idea and, and uh, thought maybe we should give it another go um, using uh, modern uh, technologies. And the first thing we did, um, and uh, the person who did this in our labs named Long Dang, um, he uh, got all of the anaerobic uh, bacterial strains that he could buy from the ATCC <laughs> and injected them all into tumors uh, and saw whether any of them had a good response. And he found actually only two, Clostridium novii and Clostridium cerdeli, which had um, particularly promising effects. Um, these uh, bugs were very motile, and they didn't kind of stick uh, to where uh, along the needle injection tracks. Uh, they traveled throughout the tumors. And um, this is a picture of a slide from one of the initial tumors he treated. You can, uh, it's a gram stain, obviously. You can see all the bacteria there in the tumor, which is in the part on, on, your, on your right. Uh, well, I don't know, right, left, something. The red cells are the remaining tumor cells. Uh, the blue are the bacteria, and they kind of eat the bacteria. I mean, the bacteria eat the tumor, really. They use it, they digest it, until they reach the, um, uh, the well-oxygenated rim of the tumor when they stop. And here are... Uh, and the effects before C. novi, um, you see those nests of tumor cells, which are in blue, separated by the stroma, um, as well as necrotic tissue indicated in red. The red part is where the tumor has outgrown its blood supply. In 12 hours after um, sticking these bacteria in the middle of a tumor with a needle, you can see that the tumor has completely lysed. It's gone. Um, six hours later, the happy mouse unfortunately died. <laughs> now, I'm not a board certified clinician, but I recognize this is not a good thing. <laughs> it turned out that the lethality uh, was mainly due to a toxin, a systemic toxin that was secreted by these bugs, which was, had been appropriately named years before lethal toxin. <laughs> um, and the lethal toxin gene was fortunately carried on a phage episome. Uh, the technical term is pseudolysogeny, and we could easily get rid of that, even without genetic fancy genetic engineering techniques just by, uh, just through selection. And we did, and long created a strain called C. novi NT. NT, standing for what we hoped would be non-toxic. And it was, in fact, considerably less toxic. And we created a strategy called COBOT, which stands for Combination Bacteriolytic Therapy. Um, we injected spores now not into the tumor itself, but into the bloodstream. The idea was that these spores would travel all through the body, but would only germinate where there was hypoxia, actually close to anoxia. Um, these bugs were exquisitely sensitive to oxygen. They don't germinate, um, for example, even in partially oxygenated tissues, such as uh, cardiac infarcts in mice but they do germinate in tumors. And then um, it, we combine that. The bugs germinate in the middle. They destroy that tissue. And we combine it with conventional agents, which work better when tissues are uh, vascularized. Obviously, they have to get to the tumor cells to do their thing. And the combination results in obliteration of, we hoped, the whole tumor. Here's our bug team. Um, and the drug that we combine it with, actually, the best drug is a drug wrapped 
in a nanoparticle, a liposome. Um, and these nanoparticles release the drug uh, when they get to the tumor, and the bacteria enhance that release through the secretion of lipases, phospholipases, etc. And I'll just briefly go through a, a couple of, of slides to show you the effects in animals. Here we have CNOVI, it's a survival curve. The animals die in a couple of weeks. Um, with an activated CNOVI or without any treatment. With this Doxel, which is the drug, they live a bit longer. Um, with live CNOVI and T spores, they do better, and with both, uh, they're cured, at least in this animal model. Um, here's a picture, sometimes more informative than a graph. This is what you see six hours after treatment, a little blush on the tumor surface. Fourteen hours later, you see a black spot. 24 hours later, you see a scab, and then that scab generally resolves. Six days later, you can see the scab two weeks, and then it's gone. So this is what happens in the best cases. And my time's running out, so uh, I, I don't want to prolong this, but the same thing happens in rabbits. Here you can see um, an air pocket formed by the gas that the CNOVI secretes in the middle of a liver tumor in a rabbit. Also worked well in rabbits. Um, induces a potent immune response, as you can imagine. This is just like putting Freund's adjuvant in the middle of a tumor, except you're doing it systemically. We've done 17 pet dogs and two humans now. Um, and the pet dogs we do, of course, because these are spontaneous tumors, not tumors that we transplant. So they're much more like humans, and the regulatory issues uh, are considerably easier to circumvent. I shouldn't say circumvent. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, if there ever was. <laughs> considerably easy to satisfy. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, in this graph, uh, the yellow, red, and green represent a mouse, a, a, a pet dog, and a human, the temperature curves after injection of spores at time zero. And uh, I don't know which is which, but that's the point. They all get fevers uh, somewhere uh, between 15 and 24 hours after you administer the bugs. Um, here is the response of uh, our second patient, which again is a very low dose and spores alone. We're not yet allowed in either humans or dogs to give cobalt the combination. We have to demonstrate safety uh, of the uh, bacteria first before we can do that. And uh, the y-axis here is C-reactive protein, which is a measure uh, of an infectious process, basically. and on this patient, he got a fever, C-reactive protein went up, antibiotics started, that's the nice thing here. We have an antidote. Unlike most chemotherapeutic agents, which don't have antidotes, patients just get sick, sometimes very sick and die. Here we have an antidote. You can give an antibiotic. These bugs are exquisitely sensitive to penicillin and a lot of other drugs. <laughs> this is a tumor marker. Uh, and you can see it, it decreased by 90 percent. And we've had about half, uh, both patients and about half of the dogs uh, have responded to the therapy in the sense that the bugs have germinated within the tumors, sometimes induced regressions like this. Um, there has been toxicity, um, as you would expect. This picture shows the intense inflammatory reaction. It's really just like what you get with Freund's adjuvant. Uh, that occurs at the tumor site, lots of granulocytes, um, lots of uh, cytokines, as you see on the next slide. It induces a septic-like state. Fortunately, we can control that with antibiotics um, as well as with anti-inflammatory drugs um, in people and, and in most of the dogs. The only dogs we couldn't control it in were dogs with osteosarcomas. Bone tumors uh, perhaps are uh, hard to get the antibiotics into. So here's what we hope to do in the future with this approach. We want to use a dose escalation, leaving out antibiotics until patients get sick enough that they really need them. 
Right now, we have to give them as soon as they get a fever. Um, we want to give anti-inflammatory agents like steroids with them. We want to combine it with doxyl or other agents. And now, we thought this would be easy, but it turned out to be very difficult. Uh, we can engineer CNOVNT to secrete whatever we want. Um, cytokines that are protective, cytokines that, tumor, that destroy tumors, other kinds uh, of agents. Uh, we thought it would be just like E. coli engineering these strains. It took us actually six years to figure out how to engineer them, but we can do it now. Um, will it work? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's promising, but lots of drugs are promising that fail in the clinic either because they're too toxic. Um, uh, but I think if it uh, does, or what will actually work in cancers, is certainly going to be something new, not same old, same old, uh, not drugs that have been used for years, not small molecules. It's going to be some sort of biologic therapy, perhaps immunotherapy, perhaps gene therapy, perhaps bacterial therapy, probably none of those and something else. Uh, and personally, uh, I think our best hope for getting cures from cancers uh, is with young people. That's what I tell my students. The reason young people are so good at research is because they don't yet know what can't be done. Uh, and people like me, with a lot of experience, know exactly what won't work, what won't work so we won't try it. They will. They're our future, and I'll stop there. Thank you.